Cool, good morning, welcome. Who predicted? You predicted that attendance would only go down. And I think I agree with you. Tuesday of week 10, a um, little bit less than Tuesday of week 9. See, now I wish I was taking attendance. That's a pity. Um, just for my own interest. Well, it's Tuesday of week 10, so welcome back. Uh, we've got another fun morning of thermodynamics in front of us, I think. Um, I've, do, I've got a little bit of preamble as well before I actually get to the, the content. But what I was going to do this lecture is mention what we talked about last lecture, because uh, that's something that we normally do. And I want to go back and revisit the cycles. So I've gone through the basic cycles all the way around. I want to go back and revisit the cycle. And today, I want to revisit the Brayton cycle. So we did the Brayton cycle. We did the simple Brayton cycle. Now what can we do to the Brayton cycle? There's a few things we can do to improve its efficiency. There's something else we can do called jet propulsion, which is where we don't use the Brayton cycle for work. We use it for thrust. Um, and so I want to talk about that. And then next week, I'll find something else to talk about tomorrow. But next week, I want to do the ranking cycle and all the different things we can do with the ranking cycle. So I want to lead into that by saying, well, you can combine the Brayton and the ranking, and that's something you can do. Um, so that was that. But I just posted a few thoughts. Thermodynamics has been in the news recently. This I, I alluded to it, but I hadn't linked the article. I wanted to link the article. Um, so Liddell Power Station is an old coal power station. I think it's due to shut down in, if I said 2022, is someone going to correct me on that? So it is now 2018, so just after you graduate. And so this is, then they're building a gas-fired power station to replace the old coal-fired power station. Should be completed during 2022. 400 mil, if they're spending 400 mil, I would reckon engineering would be something like 20% of that, 10% of that if they're buying it offshore, depending on how much offshoring they do. Um, so they've probably got, oh, Call it 10% maybe. Could be shipping turbines. Yeah, so they're buying, they're buying the turbines and stuff. We still need in-house resources in Australia. So maybe they're spending $40 million on engineers between now and then. Still feels high. Anyway, if thermodynamics is something you think you like, and you're like, OK, well, I could work in Newcastle. Um, there's nice beaches. And a two-bedroom unit doesn't cost $1.5 million, <coughs> like it does in the eastern suburbs. Uh, you know, this is like, as you graduate, they might be looking for graduate commissioning engineers and maintenance engineers and so forth. You know, that's, anyway, so I just put that there because it's something to get you thinking um, about possibly your future. I think the article is academically interesting anyway. Um, this, I thought this was interesting. NASA says SpaceX rocket technology could put lives at risk. So we've got enough thermodynamics under our belt now, I hope. Um, <clears throat> here's the idea, you make the rocket smaller by cooling the propellant down before you put it in the tank. So it's a gas, so the colder you get it, the same pressure. Sorry? Or you keep... You keep it the same size and you put more massive fuel in it by shrinking it, by cooling it down. And so to do that... Sorry? Mm, yes, but this is doing it more so, yeah. And it, it's requiring that rather than fuel up the rocket and then put the astronauts on the rocket for manned flight, um, they want to put the astronauts on, do everything else, get the thing ready to go, put in the fuel, and then launch and keep it as cold as possible. So that's the, um, that's the thought. NASA says, what if it blows up while you're fueling? Um, I think it's a really interesting engineering exercise, because you've got technical aspects, you've got really high level numbers like PV equals MRT that we can understand because we've done second year engineering, down to the really complex, what's going to blow up? Um, how's it going to happen to the managerial congresses involved? You know, will the USA government allow SpaceX to put astronauts into space using this method? So there's political, there's social, there's just a bunch of factors. Um, it's just 
engineering. I thought there was enough thermodynamics tie-in. I thought this was interesting enough to talk about. Um, I was ironing my shirt this morning while Vanessa was feeding Josiah, and I started talking about some of the detail of this, and she fell asleep. It's like, oh, this is what I'm starting my lecture with to engage the students. Um, but she's up all night. <clears throat> she's up three times over the night with, um, with Josiah, and it's me, right? <clears throat> Poor girl married an engineer, and now she's married to a lecturer. <laughs> I know. I was earning more money when she married me too. It's dreadful. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, here's a little something extra as well. I just, I'm just throwing in some, just some stuff because I think we know enough about thermo now. I, I've had this since the beginning of the session, but I think we know enough about thermo um, to make some of this sort of stuff interesting. This is from a fourth year petroleum elective. I don't know if it's elective or core, but if you're a petroleum engineer, you'd do thermodynamics later and you'd have more chemistry. So you would have done more chemistry, and then you do thermo, and this is where they get to. Um, I think this last thing is of interest, because <clears throat> I didn't know this was how it was done, but when I read it, I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Right? So to transport liquid, liquid natural gas, okay, they keep it at negative 163 degrees C, sorry, I'll highlight that. So they're keeping it down at what I consider to be cryogenic temperatures, how do you keep the gas that cold? Or in this case, it might be a liquid, indeed. Um, some of the gas is allowed to boil off to keep the rest of the gas cool. Which may or may, hopefully, well, that may or may not have made sense before you studied thermodynamics, but hopefully it makes sense now. So, you know, they've got some, they've got a liquid container, rather than contain it at a constant volume, so if you had an isochoric process and you added heat, you're going to have a, your pressure is going to rise. Rather than do that, they relieve some out. The energy that that takes as it boils keeps the rest of the liquid cool. And one presumes that you're still going to have that you know, atmospheric gas. You wouldn't just vent it to atmosphere. You might use it to run the, the services on the ship or generate power for the ship or so forth. Um, I didn't know that was how they transported LNG. Um, and the other stuff is interesting as well. So this is what they do for their thermodynamics. Um, I thought it was interesting. I'm also in touch with Pierre Leclerc, who, study, uh, who teaches thermodynamics for chemical engineers. And um, their, their thermodynamics gets harder quicker. But I think it can, because they've done, because they can guarantee they've done a couple of chemistry courses. But I'm like, at one point they were talking about merging the courses. And I thought, oh, I just feel like thermo is hard enough for mech engines without putting in, like um, we talk about fuel substances, they talk about multi-phase um, environments. So you've got not just, you've got substances that don't mix and so forth. We might do that mm, with um, absorption refrigeration. We just might look at one system, ammonia in water, and just look at how, how complex that is. Um, so I thought that was interesting. I don't know, there was something. I'm going to introduce, so let's do, let's do that, and then we'll come back. So what have we covered so far? So auto cycle, diesel cycle, and Brayton cycle. So we started there, OK? We've kind of gone like this, which was the plan. So I'm glad that we've fulfilled the plan. Except for the dual cycle, which isn't listed there, I think all the cycles we've done so far have only had four state points. All right, so the other cycle, you've got atmospheric air drawing in, you compress it, you add heat, you go to state point three, and then you have a power stroke, you go to state point four, and that's it. So you've got four, um, not related to the four strokes, only related to two of the strokes, you've got four state points. Brayton cycle, atmospheric air in, compress it, add heat, go through a turbine. Rankine cycle, simple Rankine cycle, uh, saturated liquid water, pump it, add heat, go through a turbine, right? So it's pretty much the same sort of thing. Vapor compression just the other way and reverse Brayton, the Brayton cycle the other way. I want to introduce the idea of um, cycles that have more than four state points. Um, dual cycle we've kind of done, state point A, as it was. But now we're going to get into larger and more complex um, kind of systems. Cool, that was my intro. I wanted to show you the process flow diagram for a calciner that I worked with over in Western Australia. 
because um, I think it's interesting and might be instructive. We'll see. Hopefully it's interesting if you learn something that's incidental. Um, when we've been solving problems, I don't know how to introduce this without it being confusing, that's okay. So when we've been solving problems, we've been doing a state table, okay, where we list the properties that we uh, want consideration of down the left hand side, and we list the state points along the top. So this is state point one, state point four, state point 101, state point two, state point three. Okay, they're not in order, that's fine. Right. Um, so there's a bunch of state points. And these are actually ordered, so they're, they might be in order. These are ordered by what's happening. So this is solid material, is primarily flowing through those state points. Uh, gas is primarily flowing through those state points. And then you've got a water spray, which I alluded to in a previous lecture as well. Um, you've got some air, you've got some dust, right? So there's a bunch of different fluids they're tracking through a bunch of different state points. And then these are the properties down the left-hand side. And this is their value at each of those state points. So it's an extension of what we've done. We've just done four state points and maybe a limited number of properties. Okay? You don't need to care about how much water is in your airstream, for example, H2O in your gas stream. Um, when you're dealing with dry air and you're making the assumption the chemistry doesn't change. But when you go to a more real scenario, you include more factors, you start to care about more things. Uh, yeah. Dalu. Um, mass flow is in tons per hour. Just out of interest, this is a big, this is a big unit. Oh, sorry, calciner. What's a calciner, what is it doing? Um, it's taking in wet alumina hydrate. So you've got Al2, 2O3 plus OH plus H2O liquid. So that's a chemically bonded, so that's aluminum oxide with some hydrate um, on it. And we're firing it like firing in a kiln because we just want the aluminum oxide. So we just want the Al2O3 out of the system and we want to drive the rest off as water. So that's, that's what we're doing with this whole process. And then this is the process flow diagram. So we've seen a couple of process flow diagrams in our chemistry, uh, in, our, in our work through thermodynamics. Um, let's track two different things. I'll track the air and the and the gas. Sorry, the, the gas and the um, the gas and the solid product. Let's maximise that. Cool. This is where the air goes into the system, called the forced draft fan, and the air goes up into cooler number four, up into cooler number three, up into cooler number two, across into cooler number one. Up into pyro 4, so pyro stands for heat, across into pyro 3, up into pyro 2, and then through a loop into pyro 1, and then is exhausted through a baghouse filter. So this is like socks that you blow air through and the socks collect the dust and then you empty it out. Yeah, they're, they're terrible to work with. Um, so, and what's happening with the air? The air's coming in at ambient conditions, so it's coming in at um, normal temperatures and pressures, and being forced, and in CO4 it's getting a little bit hotter, CO3 it's getting a little bit hotter, CO2 it's getting a little bit hotter. Let's draw a graph of that. So let's say temperature and distance one, two, three, four, actually, go, yeah, it goes, the air goes through four, three, two, one. These are all C's, and these are P's, four, three, two, one. And the temperature comes in at nominally ambient and goes up, 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 up. When it gets to the pyrometer, it's burned, and so it goes up. 
and then it goes down, 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 and exits at some other temperature. So that's what the air temperature is doing. The solid product, which we can do in red, so this is wet product, wet feed, coming off the wave feeder. It's physically wet. If you, if you feel it, it leaves your hands wet. Um, and it goes into a feed screw. When it hits the air, the air is traveling fast enough to entrain the little particles in the gas stream. So that goes up. And remember, the air here is a little bit hot. So it starts to warm up the particles. And then when we go up to P1, this is a cyclone like your Dyson vacuum cleaner, for example. So the solid product goes round and round and round and gets spat to the outside. The clean air stays on the inside and goes up. And the solid product goes down into another gas stream, which entrains it up. It goes round PO2, down into a gas stream um, where it gets fired, then goes down and so forth. So the solid product goes back the other way and enters in cold and it gets warmer, 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 warmer until it gets to PO4 where it gets hot and then it gets colder, 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 colder. So the solid product's going that way and the, oop, and the gas stream is going that way. So when the when the air is at the end of its cycle, it's transferring heat, up, up, up. It's transferring heat down to the incoming product. And as the material's leaving, so it's now been calcined, it's been heated up as hot as it needs to be, now you need to get it cold again so you can put it on a belt without burning the belt. It transfers its energy back into the incoming gas stream. So it's a counterflow heat exchanger. Yeah. The C's and P's at the bottom. Good question. What are the C's and P's at the bottom? The names of these vessels. That vessel is called CO4, which stands for cooling. So uh, it's German, uh, German manufacturer, F SL Smith, right? And so the P's stand for pyro. So the material is getting hotter in the P sections, and the C's stand for cooling. The material is getting colder. And indeed, I've possibly drawn that. I follow the air rather than the solid product. But the solid product sees P1, then 2, then 3, then 4, then C1, then 2, then 3, then 4. So it gets cooled. Um, and this whole, so this whole exercise is about how can we get the product to calcining temperature, which ends up being, I think, 940. I have the PFD. I could check. What? <coughs> temperature, temperature, that one there, 960. All right. So how do we get the alumina up to 960 so it calcines, so the chemical process happens, the, um, this uh, entrained water is driven out of, the, out of chemistry, using as little energy as possible. And the way that we do it is we recover energy at both ends of the system. So we recover energy from the air to make the material hot, and then we recover energy from the material to make the air hot. And your heat addition, in terms of burning gas, in this case it's natural gas, so this temperature rise here comes from burning natural gas in the pyro. Um, there's actually a, um, like a firing chamber with six nozzles coming in, you force air and so forth. Um, so it, fire, it, uh, it gets the alumina to 960. The adiabatic flame temperature I think is 1300. But it doesn't get the product that hot. Um, cool. There's a bunch of other thermodynamic stuff that I could say about this, but I wanted to introduce the idea that we've been doing four state point cycles. And I've only drawn the main thing, there's some cooling water and blah, blah, blah. You know, there's a bunch of different um, systems, um, heating and cooling this and so forth. Uh, but I just want to cover A, in, in, in industrial, well, in this industrial context, the idea of a state table is a reasonable way of communicating um, properties of fluids. 
And that just from a high level numbers, like it's not enough, you don't know yet what the angle of this cyclone should be or a bunch of different, you know, there's a bunch of different mechanical stuff you don't know, but just from an energy basis you can say, okay, the air is getting cooler by this many degrees C, the material is getting hotter by this many degrees C, these are the mass flow rates, yep, it kind of works. So um, that was interesting or it wasn't, that's okay. Uh, were there any other questions about that? We didn't adjust the angle, we bought them. Yep, we bought them from F.L. FL Smith and they, they, that was how they came. Um, yeah, yes. Good question, what was the engineering? So I was the engineer in charge of maintaining this for 18 months. Um, and gosh, there were some stories, but I don't, I won't tell them in this context. You know, we worked for, you know, about a year on the draft fan. Oh, interestingly, this whole system's at vacuum. So the draft fan is stronger than the, the induced draft fan is stronger than the forced draft fan, um, and all the pressures are negative throughout the whole system. So anyway, there's a bunch of different stuff. Cool, anyway, hopefully there's enough, you know, so we've done some thermodynamics, now we can start to think about some cool stuff. We will um, get on to some more complicated cycles today. What do we do on Wednesday? I did a session on, that's a problem with long introductions. People fall asleep just as they get to the material. Um, or wake up. So we talked about the Rogers and Mayhew tables for refrigerants. You're gonna need it in lab T4, which I've also released. The first lab is today. Who has their lab today? Good, a couple of people. Um, I dropped by the lab um, supervisor this morning. Uh, he didn't have enough seats out, so we fixed that. Hopefully there'll be somewhere for you to sit. And the refrigeration system needs regassing. So we'll have to see how the thing performs for your lab those who put up your hand. Um, if we get it regassed on Friday, then next week's participants will get a different set of data. I'll share all the data with you, and we can see a step change in performance, maybe. Like, hopefully the COP next week will be higher than the COP you guys calculate, for example. Um, I'm okay with that. It still makes things cold, but not as cold as it should. Um, so that's a little thing. You'll need the Rogers and uh, Mayhew tables. You used to do four interpolations. I've just had to do two and then look the rest of the properties up online because people got bogged down in doing interpolations and missed some of the larger things with the lab. So hopefully you can answer some of the bigger questions and spend less of your time doing interpolations, but you do know how to do interpolations, or you need to know. So I've left two of those in. And then we did the reverse Brayton cycle, which is just real quick four-step cycle. Um, the great news about that is we've now done all six of the main cycles that we wanted to study in the course. Um, like with my alumina calcina example, this isn't everything that happens thermodynamically, but hopefully it gives you enough exposure to enough different things that when you see something different, you go, oh yeah, okay. You know, it's not a, it's not a Brayton cycle, but it's something. Energy is being transferred, mass is, mass is flowing, you know, you kind of, have a sense for it. Um, now I want to come back to the Brayton cycle and do advanced Brayton cycle, modified Brayton cycle, I think I've called this um, lecture. Next week I want to do modified Rankine cycle. We might do a different type of refrigeration called absorption refrigeration, um, just to try and pick at the edges of some of what you can do with thermo. Now we've got the basic thermo knowledge. Um, so let's improve on our Brayton cycle. And what sorts of things can we do with the gas stream once we've got our normal four-step um, Brayton cycle? Cool. Oh, sorry, and the things we're gonna talk about are regeneration, um, which is capturing some of the exhaust heat back into the incoming stream. So it's a regeneration. We're gonna talk about intercooling. Um, so doing a uh, compression in a few stages. We're talking about reheating, which is doing your turbine in a few stages, and then put it all together and show you a cycle, a more advanced cycle than what you guys have, have seen. So that's the intention. Cool, so regenerator. 
So if you had tracked or you've done a few examples from the Brayton cycle, I think this is the week for PSSs. Uh, certainly I've, I've done an example in class. You may have noticed that the exhaust temperature for the gas leaving a Brayton cycle is quite high. And so you say, well, what can we do with that uh, temperature? What can we do with that hot gas to help improve thermal efficiency? And a regenerator is one of the things you can do with it. A combined cycle is the other, another thing you can do with it. We'll talk about that at the end. So what does that look like? We take the exhaust from the turbine. So this is back down to ambient pressures now. So the turbine, we can't use it through another turbine because we're at the dead state pressure. We can't get the pressure any lower, but it's still got some temperature in it. And so what can we do? We can run it back through a regenerator and put some of that heat after the compressor. <coughs> Why don't we put it anywhere else? I think there's two other places we could put heat. We could put heat before the compressor, or we could put heat after the combustion chamber. So why have we put the regenerator between the compressor and the combustion chamber? From a first law perspective, you'd get the same, if you, if you transfer the same amount of heat, from a first law perspective, if you put the heat in before the compressor, all the maths would work out exactly the same. But what would it do to the compressor? Reduce the mass flowing into it. Yes, it's along the right lines. Yep. I guess I was thinking you'd have the same mass flow the whole time. So I, but it's the same answer, but I think it would make the compressor bigger, physically larger to handle the same mass flow, or the same compressor would have less mass flow. So yes, yeah. So if we put the heat in before the compressor, then the air would become hotter and rarefied. Yep. You're saying that because this temperature is more similar to this temperature, whereas this is a colder temperature, that the heat exchange would be more efficient. From a second law analysis perspective, it would be, but you'd actually find, because this temperature is lower here, you could get more heat. You actually get more heat transferred because you're transferring it to a colder fluid. Um, so you get better first law efficiency, but the physical size of the compressor uh, would have to increase, would be the, would be the main reason. We find that we can't put a regenerator between those two pipes because state point three is hotter than state point four. After you've finished running through the turbine, your, your fluid will be, or in this case your gas, will be colder than it was at the start of the turbine, so you can't put a regenerator there. So you don't put it before the compressor, you'd have to increase the size of the compressor and get slightly less efficient compression. We regenerate between the compressor and the combustion chamber. This is what the cycle now looks like. So what are we doing? We're compressing from state point one to two. We're adding heat from state point three to four. We're running through a turbine from state point three to, sorry, two to three. Running through a turbine from state point three to four and then That doesn't sound right, sorry. Compress, add heat, yes, and then exhausting from state point four to one, my apologies. So now we've added another state point, state point six, and we've said, well, between state point four and state point six, let's remove energy through a heat exchanger instead of just exhausting it. So that's between state point four and state point six, and between state point two and state point five, let's regenerate that heat then between those two and we find that whatever heat we can take out of the exhaust stream between four and six goes into the incoming stream between state two and five and directly reduces the amount of gas that we have to combust to perform to get to the same um, temperature at state point three.
What's the limit of regeneration? How hot can we get state point five? In theory. Not the com heat coming out of the turbine. Good. Temperature coming out of the turbine. <laughs> From a language perspective. So, right, the highest that five can get on this TS diagram, the hottest that we can get out of the heat exchanger must be whatever temperature state point four is. So you've come out of the um, you've come out of the turbine at state point four, okay? That's the hottest that the fluid can leave the heat exchanger at state point five. And so there's a five dash on the on the board there, indicating the hottest that you can get out of there. In, in actuality, it'll be something lower than that because you need a temperature difference to drive the heat exchanger. And so then we can define an effectiveness for the regenerator being how much heat did you actually regenerate through the regenerator divided by what would be the theoretical maximum heat you could regenerate through the, um, through the regenerator, which becomes, what's that? State point five minus state point two. Um, so that's how much you actually regenerated. And then state point four or state point five dash, the temperature, um, enthalpy only being a function of temperature, um, five dash or four, minus two being the maximum you could have done. And if you take um, CP as a constant value, then you get that just in temperatures. If you're dealing with variable specific heats, you get a slightly different figure, although the more effective, the less that figure would change. So that's regeneration. What does that do to your thermal efficiency? Well, we find that whilst for our, when we didn't have a regenerator, you wanted really high compression ratios. The higher the compression ratio, the more the thermal efficiency. What we find with compression ratio when we've got a regenerator is for high compression ratios, that temperature difference then starts to work against us. And so actually with regeneration, you can see um, these are, you know, they go up as the pressure ratio reduces. So I think that's interesting. Um, you also don't want to add a lot of heat because that makes your temperature ratio higher as well. And so you can see temperature ratios, lines of temperature ratio there, um, saying that a lower line of temperature ratio is better for thermal efficiency. But again, you don't want to be pumping you know, cubic meters and cubic meters of air through your system only to burn a little bit of fuel. Um, at some point, power output needs to be um, taken into consideration. But just interesting that from a theoretical perspective, um, things are a bit different when you've got a regenerator. Is that okay? Everyone good? Excellent. Cool. Another thing we can do, and this isn't just for the Brayton cycle, but this is compression in general, is rather than compressing the gas all in one big hit, so if this was from state point one, and we went up to state point C, and this was an isentropic compression process, okay? What's not shown on a PV chart that I think kind of tells you a little bit of the story as well as what, why this is happening is temperature, okay? So as you go from state point one to state point C, the temperature is rising a lot, and that's forcing the gas to be less dense because it's hotter. Okay, so it's being less dense. And this is the work that you're doing is the work under that curve, the integration of the PV curve. That's the work you're putting into the system. So to achieve the same pressure, but with less work, what you can do is compress the gas some of the way and then cool it, say back to the original temperature. That'll increase the density and then compress the gas the rest of the way and you find you can achieve the same pressure at a lower temperature by putting in less work. Now, what that does is it sacrifices some of the temperature at the outlet of your compressor, so then you have to add more temperature 
by burning more gas to get the same amount of um, work out of the turbine, but work is expensive because to produce work, you know, we're talking about thermodynamic cycles of 35% efficiency or so forth. If you can save a kilowatt of work by putting in 1.2 kilowatt of extra heat energy, that's a good trade-off because your heat energy is easy to come by, work is what you want as your output in a power generation perspective. And indeed, if you could soak the compressor isothermally, which is what the Ericsson cycle uses, then you would follow the, work, the path of least work to achieve the same pressure. So in that case, your n value is one. So P, PV to the power of n, n is one um, for an isothermal process. So that's intercooling. Intercooling is also used in cars, for example. So in a, as a precursor to the auto cycle, the diesel cycle, you compress your gas, then you cool it down, and then you compress it again, and then it lets you charge more gas into the same cylinder. Um, same sort of thing. So intercooling to reduce the work required to compress the gas. The same can happen on the other end. So this is between your turbines. Let me see. Yep, good, good. I've got a picture. Picture's good. So rather than run through a turbine from the hottest point and the high pressure point to the lowest temperature and, uh, and ambient pressure point in one big hit, if you take it through a high pressure turbine and then reheat it back up to a higher temperature, then take it through a, a low pressure turbine, then you find that you can get more work out of the system without increasing the peak temperature. So the Carnot cycle says if we increase the peak temperature, then we'll have a more efficient cycle because it's to do with the ratios of high and low temperatures. Um, we can't get past a certain high temperature because of material limitations. We just can't run the fluid through a turbine um, beyond a certain temperature. And so what we can do is, well, run it through the turbine at that temperature and then reheat it back up and run it through again. This means that our exhaust temperature is also higher because rather than go through the, um, the whole pressure drop all in one go, we've added more heat later on, which makes regeneration an attractive option. And I should have said this point here, after the compression process, if you've used dual stage compression process with an intercooler, the temperature after the compressor is also lower. So we burn more gas or that also makes regeneration more attractive. So what does that look like? This is a 10 state point problem. So this is like a thermodynamic cycle. It's the same as we've done, but instead of four state points, it's got 10 state points. <coughs> we've taken ambient air through a compressor <coughs> to some medium pressure that we would have to specify. We then inter intercool it, maybe back down to the same temperature as state point one, compress it again to the higher pressure, run it through a regenerator, so you're gonna have some enthalpy loss between state point nine and 10 that's gonna become enthalpy gain between state point four and five. Then add heat Q in a combustion chamber between five and six. Run it through our high pressure, or turbine one, our high pressure turbine between state point six and seven to some medium pressure. Reheat the gas um, between state point seven and eight and then run it through another turbine. What we find with the Brayton cycle is that the combustion is a lean combustion. So we don't add, in, a, in an auto cycle, generally you're running close to, generally burning about as much fuel as that air can allow you to burn. It's, you're somewhere around that kind of figure. What we find with the Brayton cycle is you're generally running a very lean burn, and so there's still oxygen in the air after this combustion chamber, and so you can burn that again. So you just have another fuel ignition point and another, um, or fuel injection point and an igniter in the reheater and burning that takes it back up to temperature for turbine two. So that's um, what that would look like if we had those. On a TS diagram, so what have we got? We've got some regeneration, state point four to five. We've got heat in and um, 
heat in and then um, turbine, heat in, turbine, and down the bottom, compression, heat out, and compression. So that's what that looks like. Yeah? Uh, is it probably better for um, power compressed air systems? So, say, if we were just to use top gas all the time, would that have a shorter life than having an intercooler working? Yeah, okay. So what does the temperature of gas do to the mechanical compressor? I think it's a good question, and I think it's a function of design as well as temperature. So I think you could design a compressor to work at high temperatures, but I think the materials would be more exotic. Maybe things would have to be thicker because you know I know metals get softer at high temperatures. So yeah. But I'm reluctant to say that you can't design a compressor to operate at high temperatures, yeah. but it would probably be a less expensive compressor, and yes, the wear life might be, might be longer running at colder temperatures. Yeah, I agree. The converse might have to be said of, of the turbines, though. So these turbines are running at a higher temperature <laughs> because rather than going from hot to cold, they're going hot and then hot. Um, so yeah, that's an interesting... Which question? What? Yeah. Uh, we just can't do it. We can't do it in one subject in second year, actually go through designing a, a, a bladed turbine or compressor. And I would love to. <laughs> but it's like CFD, it's, it's a complicated exercise in its own right. No, it's a good, it's a good thought. Compressors. Good. That's not good. So that's what it looks like. Um, now, before I did the lecture, well, while I did the lecture on the Brayton cycle, I introduced the Erickson cycle. So the Erickson cycle is a analogy of the Carnot cycle, except it occurs in four different devices spatially dislocated. So it occurs kind of like a Brayton cycle, uh, rather than a Carnot, which occurs in a cylinder, like the Otto cycle. So we find the Erickson cycle has the same efficiency as the Carnot. So it's like an ideal, no entropy generation, um, kind of cycle, <clears throat> we find that if we had lots of compressors with subsequent intercoolers, so we had, my pen stopped working, that's fine. We had lots of intercoolers between lots of compressors down the bottom so that we basically compressed the gas isothermally. And then at the top, we had lots of little turbines, I mean little as in um, only, a sh only a small pressure drop, drop between lots of reheaters, then we would reduce the pressure isothermally, and with a perfect regenerator, we would approximate the Erickson cycle. So this is trying to get towards that. Obviously, there's some you know, practical limitations about your turbines, and there was an example. So there's a worked example in Central and Bowles, which these figures are taken from, where they got the thermal efficiency for from a simple Brayton cycle of 40% to this cycle with 10 state points at 70%. So thermal efficiency up to 70%. And then they did the calculation with the third turbine and it added another few percent. So they said, well, you know, you'd really have to question what the capital cost is versus what the improved in efficiency was worth. You know, capital cost, maintenance cost, um, complexity of the layout and so forth. So Central involved, Central's conclusion was that that's probably worth doing, and anything more than that, you'd really have to question. So that was interesting. Um, I've just got a little comment here, because this, this is the kind of question that you get in an exam type scenario. You, get, you don't get a four state point question, you get a more than four state point question. Um, there's lots of state points. You know, like you know what to do, or you know you will know. You hopefully know. I just I hope you're you're getting towards knowing. Let me just <laughs> reload that because I do like to draw. Meh. <clears throat> hopefully you're getting towards knowing what to do with a compressor. So if you were given a pressure and temperature at state point one, that seems reasonable, and the medium pressure point of state point two, 
So it goes from you know, atmospheric pressure to five bar, 500 kPa. Hand up. Nah, we'll see how it do. We'll see how it go. Thank you though. Because um, it worked, it like, worked earlier. Right, so you know, if you're given the state point one, and then you're given a pressure at state point two, 500 kPa, one MPa, you know, whatever, and you were told it's isentropic, or it had an efficiency of 92%, then I feel like, for example, because you can take isentropic efficiency into account, then I feel like you could calculate state point two. And then it says the intercooler takes the temperature back to ambient, 27 degrees, right? And then you know what to do with intercooler, and then so forth with the other state points. You know what a heat exchanger is. Um, you know, 700 joules per, kilojoules per kilogram is added in the combustion chamber. The reheater brings the heat back up to 700 Kelvin, 1,000 Kelvin, you know, whatever it is. So, um, <coughs> my, my comment on this is fluency. Um, yeah, which in a two hour exam is partially why I'm reluctant to make an open book. Um, oh, I should comment on that as well. You, you want to know this stuff and you want to be fluent, you want to be fast. So you want to know that if it's ideal gas, you want to know the formulas and you want to do them quickly. If it's a pure substance, you want to know how to read tables and interpolate very quickly and you want to get every interpolation correct. So you just want to, you know, you want to get every interpolation correct and fast. And you have to think about, okay, it's a 10 state point problem um, with a few questions at the back of it in about an hour, hour and 10 is what you want to be aiming for. Cool, good. That was that. Uh, yes, I did something. I will talk about the exam. I'll talk about the final exam and then we will have a break. <coughs> Doesn't matter. All right, good. So, final exam. What I did. What I did because um, I want to try and decouple. So, lots of students do really badly in thermodynamics. Um, <laughs> if you're feeling like that, that's you know that's not an unusual feeling. Um, but it is quite a threshold. So, so you learn things, and then and then once you know them, you you do quite well generally. Um, but I wanted to decouple students' ability to calculate the state points and then to use the state points to answer the questions. So what I did was for this kind of question, and this isn't the question, you know, whatever. But, you know, for example, I just wanted to bring it up here. Right, so what I would do is I would say, you know, here's a, here's a cycle with all these things, ambient state point one, compression, you know, medium pressure of this, high pressure of that, heat here, reheated to this temperature, so forth, regenerator of this effectiveness, you know, whatever. Right? Um, calculate the state points and fill out a table. All right? What I did was I gave marks for calculating the state point and filling out that table because I think that's important and I think it's something you learn in this subject and I think you want to do it. And then, that was part A, and then for part B, I said, uh, what were the words? You know, a system with the same makeup but different state points was analysed and this table was generated. Now use this secondary table to answer, this, answer the secondary questions. You know, how much heat was put into the combustion chamber, um, what's the entropy gain over the intercooler, you know, whatever. So I tried to decouple because, and for marking it just sucks. If you, if you calculate the state points incorrectly, then marking your answers for the second part is horrific, horrendous. Because you might be right, your calculations might be right, but your numbers are off, and it just can't tell. It takes too long. So there's that, and there's also, I wanted to give you the opportunity to, if you don't know how to fill out a table, but you know that a heat exchanger is enthalpy from the hot fluid must equal enthalpy gain from the cold fluid, and you can calculate the mass flows and so forth. Right? So if you can use the figures to answer the questions, use the numbers, I wanted you to be able to do that. Um, anyway, so hopefully that helps. Yes? What's worth more marks? I think I gave... Yeah, <clears throat> no, it's a good question, that's fine. I think I can answer that. Sorry, the question was what's, what, what's worth more marks. Um, 
knowing what to do with the figures after you've calculated them is generally worth, I think it was two marks per calculation. Uh, and so if I said, what's the heat through the combustion chamber? And you said heat through the combustion chamber is H6 minus H5, this is an ideal gas. So H minus H would be Cp, T minus T. You substituted the temperatures in and then you got out an answer. Um, maybe M dot, if mass flow was given. Um, then I'd give you two marks. <clears throat> Calculating the state points was worth a quarter per figure. So if I wanted you to give me temperature, pressure, enthalpy and entropy, then each state point is worth one mark. So 10 marks for filling out the whole table. So, yeah, yeah. But I think overall the state table is worth less. But, yeah, I don't know. Try and do both. <laughs> but yeah, but you can answer the second part of the question before you answer the first part. Um, by that, like if you feel more confident with knowing what to do with the numbers once they've got them. Answer part B, okay, come back, okay, which numbers can I fill out in the state table? Easily, hard, whatever. Um, yeah, don't want to talk too much about the final exam, but I just, hey, I'm decoupling it because I think it's better for you guys and for me. For marking, yes, Chris. <laughs> Not that I'm exam so focused, but yeah, go. Yes. Yes, the formula sheet for the exam is finished, available, and I can release it, yeah. Like, but the exam's a long time away, so I hadn't done so yet. Um, no, the exam's not three weeks away. Oh, what, what is the date of the exam? 14th? 12th, which is the Tuesday. So straight off the back of, so the Queen's birthday long weekend on the, that's dreadful. I've got an exam on the Saturday of the long weekend and now also the Tuesday. So I will go away with my family some other time. No worries. Uh, FEA, sorry. My apologies, I'm not sitting an exam. I teach two subjects and they both have. No, no, I'm not studying a long weekend. No, no, once, once I stop delivering content, I'm like, it's basically holidays. Studio is, anyway. Academics have a different, um, get dizzy at different times than, uh, than students do. <coughs> cool. Like, you know that 26 weeks of the year that you're not in classes? Yeah, <laughs> like those. Academics are too easy. No, no, it's fine. Radio! I, anyway. Formula sheet, good, yes, that was the question. Formula sheet. Um, it wasn't, it was that it wasn't the case in the, in, class, in the main class test, but in class test one supplementary, um, I had a process where, and it just revealed a misconception, so it was fine. Uh, you know, there was some liquid water in a chamber and I was heating it up. And I think the piston was moving. So it was, it ended up being isothermal because the water was boiling and so it was doing so isothermally. And then in the formula sheet, I had work for, iso, you know, work for isothermal process equals, and it might be P1V1 log V2 on V1. That feels about right. Okay. Of the people who sat the supplementary for class test one, so people who were ill or otherwise um, on the Monday night, right? Uh, all of them, all of them used this formula. So I said this was isothermal. And it was an isothermal expansion process as the water was boiling, okay? And they all used the formula on the right. Can you see what the problem is? Satisfy yourself that you know why you shouldn't have done that and what the work would be. So it was, um, you know, pressure one equals 150 kPa. Um, the temperature is, oh no, it has to be saturated. I have to look at the table. Let's do atmospheric. 101.325, temperature equals 100 C, you know, volume one equals something. 
you know, and then heat's added until all the water's boiled. What's the second volume? What's the volume V2? And therefore, what's the work from the process? Okay, let's take a break. If, you're, if you don't know why you shouldn't use the formula on the right, have a chat to someone during the break. And so the question is, why is the formula on the right not appropriate, even though it is the appropriate formula for the isothermal process? If you've got the formula wrong, someone tell me, not good. Um, and what was the right formula to use? Because it's a real classic mistake, and I want you to be aware of it. Let's jump back when the minute hand's at the two, and we'll talk about the jet propulsion cycle.